In Isaiah chapter 1, the first couple of verses, it says this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. Many of you have already mentioned, a few of you have at least, that you've already read the first three church chapters of Isaiah as you knew we were heading into this. And we just encourage you to get ahead of the game and read the book and, and be prepared as we go through this. I'm not going to hit every verse in the first three verses, but I think by you reading that, you've probably already recognized that it's definitely not the easiest book to read, nor is it uh, uh, always uplifting because there's a lot of tragedy in the first few verses and the first few chapters of this Old Testament book. Behold the voice of God is the theme and the title for today. That is the launching point of our series titled Behold and when you think about the word behold, what that means for us, what that should mean for us, uh, is maybe in a modern update or translation of the word, is, is simply just, just stop and look and listen. Slow down and take time. Right now on planet Earth, there are over 8 billion people, apparently, at last count. I didn't make the count, but someone on Google did. 8 billion people. That means that human beings are speaking as many as 50 trillion words every day in various languages around the planet. And of course, with the growth of the internet and Wi-Fi accessibility at different places and podcasts and, and songs and movies and television shows and streaming channels and all that comes with that, we are drowning in a sea of voices. There's a lot of talking going on. There are a lot of voices speaking. But the question for us today that we come together and we pause for this moment and try to break out of the routine of, of just life and even the routine of church is to ask this question, do you hear the voice of God? Do you hear what he's saying? Can you hear what God is saying in the midst of trillions upon trillions of things being said daily? In 1972, Christian theologian Francis Schaeffer published a book. You may be aware of Schaeffer. Some of you have read his writings. Schaeffer published a book titled, He is There and He is Not Silent. In this book, he argued the question that human beings have been seeking the answer to for millennia. Why is there something rather than nothing? As I said, Schaeffer was a deep thinker. And in his question that he articulated so well, he concluded with an answer that he said was the only possible answer that he could come to, and that was that there must be the existence of the triune God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who speaks, and through his speaking, reveals himself to us. The reality is that even based on the title of Schaefer's book, there is a presumed silence of God. I don't know if you, you knew that, but in the modern era, which we have been far beyond that, the modern era, the question of is there a God and does he exist, the postmodern era, is there a God and is he worth listening to, and uh, in the post-Christian culture that is overwhelming many parts of our world and nation even now, those questions still remain. And with a religiosity that so overwhelms many of us, people tend to, even in American evangelicalism especially, be satisfied with the God we seek, not necessarily the God who is. The God we seek that is uh, little more than a Christian version of a good luck charm. The God we seek that has verses in scripture to give us life and to give us instruction, but have been turned into little more than Christian versions of fortune cookie uh, messages. That look ideal on a refrigerator magnet or on a wall plaque or on a t-shirt, but there doesn't provide enough depth for us to go into this to understand that which God is actually saying. And so we hear phrases, but not necessarily the words. See, we like a verse a day to keep the trouble away, tr troubles away version of Christianity in our culture today that ultimately is, is empty. And while I guess any verse from Scripture, since it's the inerrant word of God and is provided is better than nothing, I would dare say for the church, we must go beyond that. 
We must go beyond that. No wonder there's a struggle to hear God. But here is the great promise. We can know God, and we can know, because he has spoken. God has spoken, and God is speaking. Words create worlds. That's a phrase I heard in leadership development classes and business classes. Words create worlds. And in the secular worldview, that would be that as a boss or a leader in a different organization says things, so goes the culture of the organization. Words create worlds. But in a theological understanding of what that truly means, it's a very literal thing when you go back to the book of Genesis and recognize that all that is was created by the one who is and has always been. And he created the heavens and the earth and the sky and the seas and the animals and humanity all simply by saying it and speaking it into existence. His words created worlds. And being image bearers of him, we too can create worlds with our words, but sometimes the worlds we create are far opposite of what he would intend for us to be creating in the world that we are living in. Our words create worlds, but sadly they often devolve into words of shame or words of sarcasm or words of negativity or words of complaining or words of blame or words of frustration and anything like that. And so therefore, whenever we ever hear a positive, encouraging, good word that's uplifting, it is so out of the ordinary, we have to share it because it's rare. My nature is negativity. I can find the negative in everything. I can find the mistakes in everything and everyone, especially the everythings and every ones that are not me. And I dare say because you have the same nature I have that you are built the same way I am and positivity and encouraging words have to be worked into your lifestyle. They're not natural. There are a few it seems natural and I am just honored to know you. But I'm telling you by and large we tend to go the other direction by the sin nature that we are born with. Words create worlds. And God spoke words and speaks words and his words create worlds and his words create his words of good news create gospel realities and good things for undeserving bad people that would be you and me that's the message of the gospel this is the voice of grace and the message of truth now the book of Isaiah for those that have gone ahead and joined us in this journey before today you have discovered it is not an easy read likely in fact, it has been called a very challenging, challenging Old Testament book. But it has also been called by theological giants from Christian history as one of the most theologically significant books of the Old Testament. Christian theologians for decades, for centuries, have described Isaiah's book as the richest in the Old Testament and the prophet himself as one of the greatest throughout Scripture. It is said that he is a prized treasure among those who have studied and read his writings. We tend to read certain books in the Old Testament looking for that which we just want to find. And I find a lot of people that like reading the Old Testament prophecies just because they're enamored by end time stuff rather than the current times realities. And while that's not bad to be enamored by end times realities, I don't think you can live in tomorrow if you ignore today. And I'm not sure you can enjoy today and live today if you've ignored the past. And so the words of God throughout the scripture are real and true, immutable and errant and given for his glory and our good from Genesis in the beginning to the amen at the end of the book as the canon has been put together by his design. So it is to our benefit to read. And I know some struggle with reading, and I'm not making fun of that, but some of you struggle with reading, and some of you have issues, and maybe it's a dys dyslexia thing, and it just doesn't work, and the comprehension is hard. And, 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 and I would say that we are in an era now that perhaps we can help in ways that we couldn't help in the past. I know that even on your phone, if you have downloaded the Bible app, which is like the number one app downloaded in the history of phones, which it's amazing we actually have a history of smartphones now, but we do. So you likely may have that on your phone. If not, you should. It's got almost every translation available in multiple languages, and if you pick the right translation or one that has it available, you can click the little arrow at the bottom, and the little British guy will read the Bible to you. But I would dare say pay attention while he's reading, because just noise is noise if you're not listening. 
Isaiah's book is deep poetry. It is a challenging book. It is a long book. And if you dare to jump into the prophet's Holy Spirit-inspired truth writings, you will no doubt stop at times saying, what did I just read? You ever been there? Okay, good, we're in the same boat. While we are not going to dissect every verse in this expansive work, we will dig deeply where we do pause, and we will step into this challenge of this prophetic word, knowing that it will be hard. It's going to be difficult to understand some of these things. Knowing that the prophet's words are like meat to many who are used to drinking milk, that means this will not be easy. But let me just respond to the thing, the question, because I hear this, I've heard it for years. Hey, this is not easy. And my response is, who said it's supposed to be? This Christian life is not easy by human understanding, but it is right. And it is a growth process as we are allowed to mature in our faith here. Challenges are not uncommon in our lives and for humanity. Human beings have for centuries loved challenges. There's a reason people climbed Mount Everest when uh, Hillary made it to the top with uh, his uh, partner from Nepal there as they climbed to the top of Mount Everest. Um, it was a, a history-making moment, and, and, and I'm no mountain climber, but I do know that when you're asked the question of a mountain climber, why'd you climb that mountain? The right answer is because it's there, and because it's hard, and because not everybody can do it. And so challenges have always been things that have drawn people to, to adventure, whether it's climbing the tallest mountain or, or going into the deepest uh, part of the ocean. We're going deeper in the ocean than we've ever been before. We know we're at the point where we think, hey, we found everything there is to find, and then soon, sooner National Geographic puts some show out. And, hey, we found some creature we never knew existed before in, in this loch in Scotland called Loch Ness, but that's a different story. It's coming, I believe. You've got to believe. We're going to space. Some of you uh, remember when um, Kennedy said, hey, by the end of the, end of the, end of the uh, decade, we're going to go to outer space. Some of you are like, that's ancient history, you know, just. But others of you are going, no, no, I remember that. And what a crazy thing for Kennedy to say in the early 60s. We're going to the moon? Really? And you know who thought it was the most crazy thing? Were all the astronauts that had to make it work. Because now they had a timeline. But now we look at it and we're like, yeah, we've been to the moon, been there, done that, big deal. Shuttles up and down, shuttles are history now. Now we've got private space flights and, you know, Captain Kirk went to space with Amazon a few months ago. I mean, it's amazing what's happening. We're going to be on Mars one of these days. I mean, maybe. I mean, it's, it's just challenges draw humanity to them because we said we, they said we couldn't do that, so we're going to do that. So we're going to go to the big, to the space and all that. We're going to go deep into the ocean. We're going to climb the mountains. We're going to go to subatomic level, levels and, and learn things in the, in the subatomic world that we've never known before. And yet when we get to a challenging word in the Bible, we go, that's too hard. Let me just read an easy verse. Folks, I'm telling you, we're made for this. We're made for the difficult. And we have a guide that's going to walk us through so we're going to go deep. We're going to go through the journey. And I'm excited that even if it's just a few weeks in Isaiah that we're going to do this. Now, this is the introduction of Isaiah, and so we need to know kind of who we're talking about. So the first question is, who is Isaiah? So let me tell you what it says. It says it in chapter 1, the vision of Isaiah, son of Amos. So there you go. He's the son of Amos. I'm glad I could help you. Isaiah is the son of Amos. Some of you right now are going, huh, that's interesting. Who is Amos? Let me tell you who Amos is. Amos is the father of Isaiah. That's who he is. So that's all we know. That's it. That's it. That's all you get. There's not like a biography underneath there anywhere. We don't know a lot about Amos under that he, other than he is the, the father of Isaiah. And, and, and yet we do know, but, well, we do believe uh, there is extra biblical rabbinical oral tradition that is, I'm not elevating that to the level of scripture, but extra biblical oral rabbinical tradition in the Jewish world says that Amos, this is going to help you, is the brother of Amaziah. And now you're going... Well, that makes sense. But not, some of you are going, Amaziah, who's that? Well, that's Amaz's brother. So I'm glad I could help you. But here's Amaziah. He was actually a king. He was a king of Judah at one point. So Amaziah being the king, if Amaz is his brother and Isaiah is his son for the genealogy experts, that just tells you he's in a royal lineage and is a man of faith uh, with some influence or being influenced by those in power at the time. 
We do know that Isaiah was married, that he had children. We believe that he lived in Jerusalem. We believe, based on what he has written and has expressed here, he was some kind of literary savant. And with all that we do know, here's what we know mostly. His name, Isaiah, means the Lord saves. So look at this. Every time Isaiah, throughout his life, entered into a room and introduced himself, he's telling and declaring, he's preaching a sermon by introducing himself, by using his name. The Lord saves. When his Amos and his mother, when, when uh, his mother gave birth and mom and dad are there and they have the, the birthday, the first one, they name him the Lord saves. It's an intentional naming inspired by God himself God did not call Isaiah out for this mission by scratching his head and going, is there anybody with a really cool name that I could put in this role? We have to understand that even before Isaiah was born, that the name was set aside by God and inspired and given to the parents to name him that so that everywhere Isaiah went, he would say, the Lord saves, the Lord saves, the Lord saves. Let me tell you about that name. As Christians were going, amen, hallelujah, right? That's a really important thing. But here's humanity, and here's his compatriots. They don't like that name. And human beings do not like that name because that name says the Lord saves and therefore it reminds us and tells us and, and, and preaches to us and convicts us that somehow, some way, we need to be saved. And in a world of self-actualization and self-focus and self-reliance, we don't want to need anybody. Who do you think you are to tell me I need to be saved? Who do you think you are to tell me I can't do it on my own? I like a challenge. I'll climb a mountain, go into the ocean, do this, that, and the other. It's all about me. That's human nature from the beginning. That's not a 20th century or 21st century creation. So Isaiah, every time he entered a room, was a living reminder to everyone he met that they did not measure up. That they, just like you and just like me, need God. So what's the book about? Well, he's a prophet, obviously. He's a seer. That means he sees. In Isaiah 2, 1, it says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, I jump to chapter 2, verse 1. I really wasn't going to focus on that verse, but as I'm reading those first three chapters, and I know, and it seems odd because you're looking for the meat of the chapter, but I end up using these introductory verses that are seemingly designed just to get us to the rest of the stuff, but I just couldn't get past chapter two, verse one, because I read that, and I, and I read it, and I read it quickly, and I went to the rest of the verses, and I went back to chapter two, verse one, and read it again and couldn't get beyond it because it threw me because for some reason that didn't make a lot of sense to me that Isaiah, the son of Amos, actually saw a word. How do you see a word? How do you see a spoken word? I mean, I can hear a word, but how do you see it? And, it, and, it, and it's intentional that the word is used in such a way. And this is, I know that our, our brothers and sisters who have hearing loss are seeing words as they're spelled out and defined for them through sign language, but that's not what this is speaking of here. Isaiah is revealing to all the readers and listeners in just this very little introduction to the rest of the story that he had a new way of seeing and we need a new way of seeing as well. God is, God is offering a new lens, a new view, a new perspective of seeing that reveals truth. And this is the voice of God revealed. And Ray Ortland, the pastor, said it this way. Left to ourselves, we live on the level of impression and hunches and gut reactions. We are blind to the things we most need to know, but a prophet was enabled to see beyond the immediate a prophet like Isaiah was not fooled or stampeded. He was a seer. He could see that which needed to be seen. And he beheld the voice of God. The focus is the book of this book. It's many chapters, a lot of poetry, a lot of prophecy. It starts off with it's a book by Isaiah, but he's not even the main character. The focus of the book of Isaiah is God. The focus of the book of Isaiah is God himself. And we are reminded throughout the prophetic word that we are to stop and behold him. If you do a word search on the book of Isaiah, you'll find the word behold keeps popping up like every other chapter, every chapter. It's all over the place. And when something starts popping up like that, it gives us reason to say, hold on, time out. What does that mean and why do I need to do that? What is behold? It's not a word we use a lot any longer. 
but it means to pause, to linger longer, to think deeply, to get what he is saying, to see what he is saying, to see the word, hear the word, know the word, and ultimately to be in the prophetic word preparing us for the New Testament, be transformed by his word, capital W, who is revealed to be Jesus the Christ, as John the Apostle said in the first chapter in the first words of his gospel account, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and that is Christ, the second person of the Trinity, and he is the transformative one that has paid the penalty on the cross. He is the one we sing of here as we sing about Old Testament, New Testament. It's all one testament at this level, and we know the gospel is true. See, Isaiah is looking ahead and warning. We have the privilege of looking behind and seeing what has already been done. But if we're not careful, we will not hear the word that God is saying, just as the people in Isaiah's world were refusing to listen as well. He is the focus. He remains the focus. God's people in this era were arrogant and idolatrous. Let me just go ahead and say that it's really good to read history and to determine that a people in the past were so bad because it makes us feel so much better about ourselves because at least we're not like that. They were arrogant and idolatrous. The concern Isaiah had for his countrymen, his brothers and sisters, his neighbors and family members, sadly, is the exact same ones we have for our countrymen, our friends, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our children, because we are a people with our human depraved hearts who are arrogant and idolatrous by nature. Many in our postmodern, technologically savvy, knowledge-based, self-actualized culture would say that idols are a thing of the past. These are historic relics designed by less intelligent people, not by the enlightened ones such as we are. For those of you like me who grew up in church settings, you've heard pastors and evangelists speak of idol worship on occasion throughout your life, and just about every time it tends to go with, uh, we have idols today, and you know what they are. They're your cars, your money, and your house. And while that's true, it just seems like that's overly simplified. Because I think the idols that we face today are more than just that which you keep in your public storage unit. I think we have other issues much deeper than stuff. It was John Calvin, the great reformer, who stated it this way. The human heart is a perpetual idol factory. And it was right when he said it, and it's right today. Isaiah understands the power of God, but he also understands the power of all the non-gods that exist as well, or the lack of power, therefore. Daily, the deepest fears of humanity hide behind these idols, these idols of amusements, of games, of professional achievements, of our children's accomplishments, or even smaller or lesser fears. We are blamers by nature. Did you know that? We're blamers. We're, we're now in the third year, I guess, of a pandemic no one ever saw, wanted to come, obviously. And, and, now, and I hear this all the time, and maybe, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who hears it, and if it's me, forgive me. But you'll hear a report, well, so-and-so has COVID, and the first response is, who gave it to him? Well, what are you going to do when you find out? What, are you going to go slap them? I don't know. What, what are you going to do? You, you, it's not like they can do anything about it. I mean, who did it? Whose fault is it? What'd they do? Who is it? You drive by on the road, you see a car wreck. And you immediately say, I bet they were texting. And maybe they were. But who, what's it matter to you? See, the point is that we are blamers because we're going to categorize everybody else on the planet as much worse than us in every category that we now excel in. It's a bully tactic that we do, but we don't know it's bullying because we don't say it to anybody else. We just kind of live it in our own little idol factory because we get everything right and everybody else's existence on the earth is designed to make me happy. And when they don't, then I'm blaming them for what they've done wrong. We are blamers by nature because it's it's somebody's fault. It's everybody's fault. We do this to deny true reality in a culture even where death is abounding, and we know this is not new, by the way. I don't know if you knew this, but ever since the first person was born, we've had funerals. But there's a whole generation of people who've done everything they've could to avoid ever speaking of death or talking about death or going to funerals. It's the blah, 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 I don't want to admit it's real. And so we avoid because we idolize life. 
Fear is replaced by self-confidence, but it's not really self-confidence. It's not confidence at all. It's a facade, so we ignore realities. We forget things, and sometimes we forget things. As we get older, we forget things. There are things, I, I, I've told myself, I've forgotten more things than some people know. That's what I tell people. It makes me feel better. It's really just a statement of reality that there are a lot more things I don't know than do. But sometimes we actually forget things on purpose. I don't know if you knew that. Choosing to forget. And not choosing to forget in a sense of forgiveness, but just choosing to forget to not deal with it. The people of Isaiah's day, we talk about them, we read about them, like, man, they were terrible, they were bad, they were sinful. God has had it, he's fed up with all of them. That's what really 1, 2, and 3 is all about, right? But they were the most religious people <laughs> throughout the region. I mean, they were very religious. They were stuck in the motions of religion. And when difficulties came, God was ignored. God was viewed as being seen as no help at all. God is the God of our ancestors. God is a God of irrelevancy. God is for those less enlightened than us. We are smarter. We are better. We are stronger. We can solve our own problems when we'll go through the motions of whatever needs to happen. So we'll go do temple worship and we'll do some sacrifices. We may add a few more false religions from the community around as well, but we'll look very religious and we'll say the right things and we'll do the right things. And that's what was happening in Isaiah his day but sadly not much has changed throughout the history of the world because people still do this kind of stuff and so when they viewed God as a monument to their ancestors but not an active living or worshipful God they lived an existence of if there's a problem we'll fix the problem and then if we think about it we'll ask God to bless our pre-made plans Christians do that today we do all that we do it we plan everything, and then if we, we, then we ask God to bless it in our prayer request time. Hey, I'm going to take this new job. I'm going to this school. We're doing this. We're relocating. We're doing this. I'm buying that. I'm doing whatever, and blah, 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 and we want God to bless what we're doing. But it's really a cart before the horse because I'm not saying you shouldn't do any or all those things, but I am saying shouldn't you start with the prayer and saying, God, is this your desire that we do? Or do we now have permission to do what we want to and just ask God, and God is our spiritual uh, good luck charm that we bring out when we need a spiritual blessing upon what we've already chosen? I struggle with that. I think it's an easy default setting for most of us. Being stuck in the, the motions of religion can lead us to that. And yet through this amazing book, Isaiah's writings, and through his obedient servant, Isaiah himself, the Lord speaks he first speaks to Isaiah, and then he uses Isaiah to speak to his people. But Isaiah, as we will discover, the message that he delivered, the message of judgment to come, the message of redemption that was available, the message of hope, the message of love, the message of a father who cares, was not received well. It was very, very unpopular. We have this weird understanding as we look back in our Sunday school classes and read about the Old Testament prophets, we forget that everybody that knew the prophets at the time, the people in leadership, tended to hate them. Because the prophets showed up to say the things that no one wanted to hear, but everyone needed to hear. So when the prophets arrive, it's like, oh, Isaiah's coming to town. Oh, he's going to speak in our church. And everybody's like, ooh. Because the word was a needed word, a prophetic word from a holy God through his instrument to an unholy people. Behold the voice of God. See what he was saying. Hear what he is saying and receive what he is saying. God is still speaking. But the question is this, are we listening? Or does God get 30 to 45 minutes a week of our time and if it's a good show, we might remember a phrase or two. That's not listening to God. That's going through the motions. Are we listening to God? There are Eight billion people on the planet and trillions of voices speaking loudly every day. But the scripture says there is still this remaining still small voice. And that is the voice of God speaking truth throughout the ages. And the truth has not changed. And the truth will not change. And it is eternally true. And the truth does not care about our opinions. I was honored to be a breakout session leader yesterday at our state collegiate conference. There were over 400 college students in worship together in Daytona. They got up early too, which was just incredible, right? And, and all I'm looking in this room at, at First Baptist Daytona, which, uh, man, the brand new church, totally, I mean, that's a story in and of itself, totally different location and everything. But 400 college students, 
Never before have I sat in a room where there were T-shirts that were blue and orange uh, that had gators on the front and sitting next to guys with Seminoles and next to some hurricanes and some knights from UCF and some ospreys from UNF and West Florida uh, and Argonauts, I think. And then you've got Miami hurricanes and, uh, and South Florida and all the different universities represented in our state sitting in the room who are all, by, you know, you know they're, they're enemies because they have these different uniforms on. But they became family and it was not become family. They worshiped as one. In the conversations we had, I had some really hard conversations with some students who are trying to find their way through the cultural uh, journey that we now find ourselves in and trying to be salt and light on a campus that, is, that needs it dearly. And they were asking my opinion, so what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I said, here's, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. It doesn't really matter what I think. And your opinion doesn't matter as much either. And we can have a motion and a vote and we can have a majority vote come to an agreement about what we think. But here's what we must know. What has God said? And the word of God speaks. And the word of God is clear. The question is, are we listening? That still small voice remains, the message remains the same, and we must behold the voice of God. Some of you are struggling, going, I don't know that I can hear the voice of God. There's two reasons for that. One is you're not a child of God. One, you're not saved. I mean, the, the, let's just, it's just reality. Some people have had the capacity to repeat a prayer and get baptized. Some of them were baptized in a church. They had no vote, vote on it at all. Their parents did it when they were babies. Some of them have been through confirmation and classes and this, that, and the other. But there's not been a life transformation moment in their life because they've never surrendered to Christ himself. They've never given up. They've never joined the family. They've just joined religion. Some by their own choice and others by, by peer pressure or by the choice of others. So there is a reality that some who never hear the voice of God, and when I mean hear it, I'm not talking audibly necessarily. I'm talking about how he speaks primarily through his word, and, 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 and that is where it is, but you're not, you know, what does God want me to do with my life? It's not a mystery. But if you don't hear him, you may not know him. There's something Jesus said about my sheep hear my voice and they know me. But what about the Christians who are secure in their faith and we know you're going to heaven, but you struggle with hearing the voice of God now? It could just be that because of all those loud voices that are overwhelming you, you are struggling to pause, stop, rest, and listen to the still, small voice. And you're confused. You're not lost. You just can't hear him. Maybe there's sin in your life that God is revealing to you even now that you need to confess to him, the sin of self-worship and self-idolatry and, or maybe the sin of panic and, and, and not trusting and or the sin of doing it my way with some kind of Frank Sinatra theology, I guess, and then asking God to bless it at the end. You cannot hear God if you, do not, if you do not know God and you will not hear God if you've filled your life with so many noises that it overwhelms his still, small voice. We talk in Baptist life a lot about going and telling others about Jesus. You need to go tell, go tell, go tell. Can I just say time out? I don't want any of you going and telling anybody until after you've stopped and listened. Not to me, but to the voice of God. Behold the voice of God. Listen, then go.